would say this is a dot product. So if these are L2 normalized, this is 1, right? Because after L2 normalization, you have uh, this unit hypersphere. 2 minus 2. And this is basically cosine similarity. The, I assume that these vectors are already normalized. Agree? So instead of optimizing this or optimizing this, it's exactly the same thing. I think this two is correct. Okay, this is the idea. I don't know if there is like many some small math mistakes. Uh, and we still keep the momentum. So momentum is again the exponential moving average over the parameters. Okay, so now we will see uh, how we avoid collapse, which is this uh, mode, this um, boxes of centering and sharpening. Okay, in this image they don't do sharpening. I will explain what they mean with centering and sharpening. Um, but it's important here to highlight that this was the first work that also was not dependent to batch normalization. So here we are not dependent to batch normalization for the first time. And for the first time, we are able to train vision transformers with this architecture. So even though vision transformers already existed for two years or something, this was the first work that was able to train with self-supervised learning on the vision domain uh, a transformer network. Yes? If you don't, like, if this doesn't rely on batch normalization, does that mean that you can also use way smaller batches? Yes, here you can use small, much, much small, smaller batch sizes. Uh, what is the disadvantage of using batch normalization? Batch normalization has a lot of disadvantages. Uh, Um, so, specifically to representation on self supervised learning, we have some pre training distribution, some unlabeled data. So these are like the images that we train on, right? And during pre-training, basically self-supervised learning, we learn some means and standard deviation that we will use for inference, let's say, when we see new data. However, this distribution is very different from the, let's say, uh, downstream task. So the, the distribution of the downstream task. Uh, so during supervised learning, this is also a problem because the training data and the test data are not always this IID independent and identity distributed. But here the gap is much, much more, much, much stronger. Uh, so and and this leads to like different okay. means which don't... Uh, yeah, so this, this mean, when, when you learn... Uh, okay, I didn't cover this one. So during training, you compute yes, yes, yes. Uh, this based on the statistics of the bus here. And on inference, because you are not guaranteed to have any available bus, you can even do inference with one, you keep an exponential moving average again of these parameters. Okay, I got it. So this, basically the statistics of the features of the pre-training versus downstream task or in supervised learning training data versus uh, test data is very likely to be different. And yes. here the, this assumption of IID doesn't even hold because we just take a more general data set and more in the wide, let's say, data set. And it's also quite um, costly. I don't know if you, if you were in the last lecture I discussed about... Uh, so when you have small batch sizes, 
this estimation is very noisy. Yes. And when you distribute uh, the like a, a training job between multiple uh, GPUs, in general workers, GPUs, TPUs, it depends on your resources. Then you have to decide if you want to use the statistics. So if you have a bat, okay, I will do one more. So if here you have a mini bat of B images, each worker, so this is a GPU, So each worker has to see one quarter of the data. So this mean will be computed to a quarter of the data. And the smaller it is, the more noise it gets. And then you have to decide either to keep the individual means or if you want to aggregate. And if you aggregate, it's much, much slower because these GPUs need to communicate so this, this is the synchronized bus normalization where we aggregate the statistics uh, which makes everything much more slow. All right. Uh, I also talked about how the vision transformer is using layer normalization and how different is layer normalization in vision, but I we'll won't go deep into that. Uh, let's take a look at centering first. So centering by itself is again an exponential moving average. This is the solution to most of the problems. But here it's not over parameters of a network, but over the output features of the teacher. So T is a subscript corresponding to the teacher model. And so I use this notation from the initial paper. So before we had this alpha, now they we call it M. And this C is the center. So this is the average over multiple iterations of the, t the, uh, the, the features of the teacher. So before softmax, we have uh, an estimate, a, a dynamic estimate, so it changes at each iteration, of all the, of the average of the output features. And what we do, we just subtract this. Uh, so we, we take this Z and subtract this, uh, let's say, the, 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 this vector. This is a, an average feature vector, very, very roughly. But you can see it from the, from the equation. And then, because you asked again, uh, if, if you want to implement this, uh, very similar to bus normalization, you also have to collect all the features from, if, if you, we will not do this in the exercise, but if you had multiple CPUs, <laughs> you have to collect, basically to aggregate all the different features and take their average. So everything that is computed over the bat size dimension, you have to rethink how you would implement it in a, in a let's say, challenging real life scenario where you have uh, multiple GPUs or TPUs even though it's not directly related to the method and the math, in practice, uh, it would take you even years to train these models on large-scale data sets with a single GPU. So you can imagine that ideally, n GPUs do things n times faster, which is not the case, but ideally, this would be the case. So something that could be trained in uh, 10 days if you had 10 GPUs, you could train it in one day. Um, and yeah, the next question was, okay, here we have this head, again, this MLP, where in the end we assign some distribution over classes, which is a softmax operation. But how, how can we choose, how can we assign features to classes or prototypes and I don't know if it's on here, maybe here. So they do this uh, ablation study and they use the 65,000 uh, output classes, which is 
much larger, like Imatnet has 1,000 classes. Um, yeah, in general, you have to pick uh, at least one order of magnitude larger than your actual ground truth, let's say, later. So if you have like Cypher 10, you have to pick at least 100. If you have 1,000, at least 10,000. Let's say this is like a very hard estimate, a rough estimate. And then uh, they were the first to show this dynamic of mode collapse and identify uh, these two cases of mode collapse, which is exactly exactly what we saw in the in, in the downstream task of image clustering. So I don't know for those of you who don't remember, I will repeat anyway. Um, So you have some classes or clusters. What we saw in image clustering was that we want to learn exactly the amount of classes that the data set have, even though we don't know which, we don't have labeled data. And when we have when we assign everything to classes, we can have two different scenarios. If you have ten classes. The first is the uniform distribution. So let's say for each input, emails, features, whatever, we have like a, a uniform distribution over classes. And of course, the uniform distribution uh, has the maximum entropy. So uniform distribution, maximum entropy, is when we apply just the centering. Uh, I, I will talk about sharpening, but you have to uh, draw the connection between centering, which is basically taking the output features from the feature network, and then subtracting this C, where this C is this uh, exponential moving average. So this is when we just take the output of the teacher. Let's use the teacher here, just to make sure. Uh, so centering by itself, kind of balancing the statistics on the bat, uh, leads to the uniform distribution. So 10 classes, 1 out of 10, maximum entropy. Um, and you can see a similar behavior of KL divergences. In both of these sharpening and centering cases, both zero. The second case is independent of the input to assign all the probability in one class. So if we have 10 classes, we always assign class 4 with a probability of 100%. And this would correspond to zero entropy which is basically when we do sharpening without centering. So when we remove the centering and apply softmax, we get this zero entropy for all the, for independent of the input, basically. It doesn't matter if it's uh, from the same image or different images. Uh, and the third case, 
which is basically what's happening in this uh, in this approach. Um, we first center the features, but then we apply a temperature scaled softmax both to the teacher and the student, but with different temperatures. I don't know if I have the equation here. So we have Here, if we use the, the subscript of the teacher, we have the teacher features that are already centered. And if we use the subset, the subscript of the student, we have the student features that are not centered. So this already creates the asymmetry. Um, so the second trick is uh, the impact of the temperature scaling before the softmax. Uh, can, can somebody remind us, even in, the, in, in general, if we have these classes, what is the, the intuition behind the temperature? Yes? It's, if you have the smaller the temperature, the, let's say, more pointy the softmax output is. So yeah, more, you, more sharp. Yeah, if so you, like if you use a very like, low temperature, you this the result of the softmax is going to lean towards one, one, one class. Yeah. It's more like one point. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, so in both cases the temperature is uh, smaller than one, but the teacher has a smaller temperature. Let's have a rub. Yeah, the temperature of the student in practice is 0 0.1, and the temperature of the, stu of the teacher network um, is 0 0.0, what is it, 7. So, a perfect training would be to have like the same temperature, like at least to bring the teacher temperature as smaller, as closer to the student, to minimize this, diver this difference. Uh, but even this in practice uh, may lead to unstable results. That's why what they do is like they do this warm up. So they start from a much smaller temperature. In practice, it is 0 0.02 or 0 0.04. And during the first epoch, so the first epoch is like an iteration of the whole data set, they linearly scale it up from 0 0.04 to 0 0.07. Uh, so even in the beginning, we need a smaller to basically uh, upweight the confidence of the teacher to create this dynamic that one network needs to be better than the other one. Okay, prototypes collapse. Uh, any question regarding this study? Again, it's. It's really connected to the two cases of collapse we discussed on EMAS clustering. So uh, these are like, uh, they can be regarded as uh, over clustering based self supervised learning methods. So that's why I wanted to show you this application of clustering, even though it relates so much to the collapse study that's happening here. And this is the dynamic that uh, you asked me about. So this is the during training, okay, the results are after each epoch, and this is the, the validation hypersonic instead. So you see they don't evolve in exactly the same way, but when the, when, when the student gets better and it's updated with backpropagation, the teacher is following up the improvement. And you see also at the beginning that the advantage is uh, almost nothing because they both start with random initialization. It's just that the teacher sees like a, a, a bigger crop of the image. Otherwise, transformations are simple. And this is really surprising to me that 
okay, just using the previous iteration, uh, the, the teacher is just the network in the previous iteration collapses. But even taking the average of the teacher model from the previous epoch, doesn't even though it doesn't collapse, it doesn't work as well as the exponential moving average. So momentum is the exponential moving average of the parameters. Can you repeat that again? So here they try different teachers. Um, so this is without uh, without gradients, but it does that this stays like an identical network. This is the the the, the model before it gets updated with backpropagation. So the same network, one iteration on the past. So it always stays random. It's in, in so if we are if we are on iteration 100, we use the the teacher model that was on iteration 99. Just so. a copy. Just a copy of the previous. But, but you start with random, and then in the second one you still have the random one from the first that you started with. Yeah, in the first step it doesn't apply, but on the step n you use the, the model as it was in the iteration n minus one the weights before they got updated. But the interesting part is here, even if you take an average of the previous epoch, uh, probably this is an average, I, I'm assuming that this is an average and not like an exponential moving average, uh, it doesn't work as well as uh, having this momentum. Yes? How do you measure the You receive They just keep, uh, yeah, this is not unsupervised. They take the checkpoints from each epoch and they, they do linear probing at each step. But it's after each level they, they, they store the checkpoints and then they do they, they evaluate directly on the downstream task, which here is like image classification on ImageNet. So it's not directly like a supervised evaluation if you like. Uh, but what's important is to understand this dynamic between instead of no less distillation and a frozen teacher to a, a teacher that is built in parallel and both models improve. Any question here? How important is it that the teacher sees like a bigger picture of the input? The hyperparameters. Ah, always the teacher always sees a, a bigger and that's problem. like essential. Otherwise this Yes, yes. In in this method uh, it's essential. So I think the hyperparameters for vision transformer is uh, from 5% to something like 25 or 30%. So this is like the, the, the range of the local crops for the, for the student. And then 25 to 100% for the teacher. Is the idea behind that that the teacher more or less learns like a global view and the, or like a global yeah, like, a, a, like has more information, so yeah. that it has the advantage. And then the cross entropy basically is uh, P teacher, P student. So this is more like the target. So this is like the target model that. It, does, it doesn't have like this one fold distribution, but it's already sharpened and already has more information. The, 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 the idea is to ultimately you just want to create a smaller push here on this uh, orange line in the beginning, and then with this way of iteratively alternating between updating the student with back propagation and the teacher with EMA, you achieve this dynamic that most, both networks evolve through training. Would you be able to explain this push again? Wh which part? You said it is in, uh, at the beginning you said... Yeah, at the beginning both networks are randomly initialized, yeah. so you want to somehow give a smaller and advantage to the teacher model. And how you do you do that? With the temperature and with the bigger crops. Yeah. Any other question? 
and here you can even train with uh, a small batch size 128 and you don't you don't see any mode collapse as uh, given that you have found the balance between the temperatures so if you switch to medical limits as you would do in the exercise you need to establish the balance with the temperature but we'll probably just provide you with the hyperparameters for that Mm. So here we are, even even less sensitive to the bat size. So I told you, with B, B all, you can train even with CCLR, which starts with 2,000 bat size at least. With B all, you can train even with 512 without without significant performance deterioration. And here, you, even with small bat size, you can work it out. Okay, how does the prediction head look like? Yeah, this is because uh, during the clustering you asked me how is this clustering head look like and it's always like an MLP with two, three layers. Um, yeah, if you want to look it out. They use a very specific architecture here, they provide some ablation studies. Um, I don't think it's extremely effective if you use, so three layers, it means that this MLP has three layers, uh, two layers. And then this linear layer has uh, one more linear layer. So this means that the MLP has two layers, and four means that this MLP has three layers. And uh, here is the hyperparameters. The hidden dimension is 2,000, and the bottom dimension is 256. But the most important is uh, that they show that bus normalization is not really uh, an important component to avoid mode collapse anymore. Okay, yes. ah, yeah. this is uh, a completely independent improvement on the literature of supervised learning. So they found that instead of having, we always talk about two views. So we take an image, we take a crop and then we resize and we have two views with different transformation. So to speed up, you can apply this technique, it's called multiple local and global crops. So it's just of having two views of that are resized to 224, they also include, in general, n times uh, 96 by 96 crops. Uh, and in this way, you are not restricting yourself to having like two views of the same image, but effectively eight views. Uh, and to compensate for the additional complexity, they resize the views to smaller ones, but you still are able to learn uh, better features as as as, as uh, measured with the K-nearest neighbors or everything. So this technique improves most self-supervised model by at least two percent. I think the only exception is uh, this B all. As far as I remember, yeah, from, from 66 to 59. All the other models. So kind of more stable versions. Okay, this is still contrastive learning. Uh, are significantly improved with this technique, and you will also implement that in the exercise. Um, so for for this approach called Dino, these are like the two global crops, and this would be the six local crops. So even though they are resized to smaller uh, spatial dimensions, they they also have these different arrays. So from 5% to 25% are the, the views corresponding to the ones that are like 6 times 96. And these are cropped, like the, the, the scale of the crop is from 25%, let's say, to 100%. Uh, I already mentioned that this was the first approach that was able to combine the advancements of uh, architectural advancements with basically vision transformer with uh, self-supervised learning. Okay, that's it for today. I hope it was not tiring. Yeah, question? So, if we take a look back, we started from this pretext task like uh, predicting the rotation of an image and yes. then we want to avoid that and use uh, introduce like 
uh, using negative samples, negative examples in this, for example, SIMP CLR. And yes, fr fr from rotation basically. We go to contrast learning. And then we. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then we want to avoid these negative samples using this teacher student architecture. Is yeah. there any work in, for example, in the next years to avoid data augmentation? Data augmentation has not been able to, we, have, we are not able to avoid this. Uh, because this is the way we inject information yes, but we discussed a, a big prior yeah it's, it's a strong human prior so you can imagine that it's sort of the super the human supervision the prior is what we did de what we define uh, as uh, what is important as an augmentation we I don't know if you remember we, we discussed that whatever gets transformed in the augmentation whatever survives let's say the augmentation is the, the, the the thing that we want to learn, so how we distinguish between these two views, even though it's flipped, even though the dog is horizontally flipped for jitter, the statistics, we still want to map them to the same thing. So this is, this is the, big, the biggest gap between natural language and vision. And ideally, we would like to have some more general application, because these pipelines are very well configured and very stable for natural limits, but we cannot extend them to. I showed you this application of depth, having like depth images as input or medical images, uh, and it's one of the challenges on the next ex exercises. You will work directly with medical images, so you cannot just adopt these pipelines. And we also have different problems and applications with uh, X-ray images and stuff like that, where there is not even the notion of three channels, or I have worked with images that have uh, five channels from some lab uh, microscopy images that this augmentation don't really are not really generalizable. For example, the saturation parameter that we play on torch vision are only referring to natural images to RGB based. But color jittering which is basically playing with the brightness and the contrast, it can be applied in any channel, in any type of images, which is the most general. So, brightness and uh, contrast, zittering more or less, plus cropping, or random resized crop, or random crop, is usually the strategy uh, to do, to go about, but, uh, even in one of my applications, we had this. Uh, okay, we had five channel images of cells, uh, and we find out that uh, random resized crop didn't work, uh, didn't achieve superior results compared to fixed crops, because. Uh, in this domain, the size of the cell may indicate their toxicity or heterogeneity or features that would be interesting to learn. So these augmentations are excellent as long as you stay on the natural imaging domain, but you always have to rethink and redesign. Very sensitive to the underlying, underlying domain. Yes, to the domain and the application. Also, in, in this application, I forgot to include that all the images from the microscope were on the fixed magnification scale, which means to say the same zoom in and zoom out in terms of the camera. So this would be identical to having all the objects on ImageNet uh, one meter from the from the lens. That's what it means. And in, in this case, we saw no improvement between random resized crops and just fixed random crops. Any other question? Okay. I think I also want to cover uh, a, a small connection between uh, if you have some time. Okay, three minutes. If you have some time, a small connection between uh, these BERT models 
uh, and the vision transformer and everything we talked about about distillation tokens and mass tokens maybe it's not the correct time but uh, I just want to emphasize that the same thing we did you did in the BERT exercise to just replace some tokens with a mass token and then predict uh, the same the correct class which basically this is called masked language modeling uh, it's more or less the same thing we use vision transformer so we have multiple tokens instead of masking in the in the sense of classification we have a new token which we call CLS token I think we also had this in the BERT exercise uh, so this would be all the patches we have uh, uh, height times width times p squared this is the path size patches and then we have as many outputs plus one which could be the representation that corresponds to the classification token so this would be the and this token communicates with all the other tokens inside the network and then we use this one uh, to do everything related to cross entropy as we would do on BERT so here, we have this image. <coughs> so if this is the transform, the visual transformer model, uh, the output is as much as the input, so the number of the sequences. And we just take the first, uh, the first, the representation of the first token or the sequence, which refers to this, which is the output of the classification token. So the output of the classification token is the only one that will be used and all the other representations are not taken into the loss function. Yes? Yeah, at, 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 the, at each step of the transformer layer you have self-attention, which is a global operation, so all these tokens, all the information from this token is routed together. They need to be com the combined information to produce, even with one transformer layer, the representation this this output Y uh, has to take into account all the paths projection, all the other tokens of the sequence. So even though we don't directly use the the output of each path on the vision transformer, we use just this one token, which is like more global token. So this is what it's not shown here. It's like a more general approach, but during the vision transformer, where you just have one output, so this P1 and P2 uh, are derived from the classification token. That's it for today. Thank you.